This is a production of Cornell University. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Warren Allman. I'm the director of the Paleontological Research Institution. Uh, and uh, um, welcome to the second or third event of the 2009 Darwin Days celebration. Um, let me make a, a couple of announcements and, and thank yous, and then uh, uh, turn it over to uh, Steve Kresovich. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank some people for making uh, this week of activities possible. Uh, a uh, alum of the law school named Stephen Lowenthal, who has been very generous to the Cornell Library, uh, is actually responsible for all of Ithaca Darwin Days over the last four years, and especially this year. Um, he not only made this week of activities possible, but he uh, made possible the, the big new addition to Darwin Days this year, which is a, an exhibit that is at the Museum of the Earth and also at Kroc Library. And uh, that, will be, that exhibit will be up for the next uh, six months at uh, the Museum of the Earth and nine months uh, at Kroc uh, called Darwin After the Origin. And it's, it is a really uh, major, amazing exhibit. And, and I encourage you all to, to go and look at that. Um, so Stephen Lowenthal uh, deserves our special thanks. Um, Harry Lee, who is a, an alum of the medical school uh, and a former trustee at PRI, uh, also um, gave very generously this year, and several units of Cornell University, and I, I want to thank um, all of those people who know who they are for, um, under the circumstances, coming up with money that um, was in short supply this year. Um, and so a lot of people uh, really stretched to make the funding possible for this. Um, let me remind you that, there, that this is just the beginning of the week. We have something every single day uh, between now and the end of Saturday. Uh, if you uh, want to find out more, IthacaDarwinDays.org. And I also draw your attention to one other new thing this year. We have asked some local, um, I guess I'll say celebrities or notables or VIPs, to answer some questions about evolution. And so if you get on the website every day, you will see different questions and uh, different answers. So we have um, the lead singer for Bad Religion, the president of Cornell, um, telling you what they think about um, evolution. Tomorrow, uh, there are um, a number of events. Massimo Pigliucci from uh, SUNY Stony Brook will be speaking. Uh, and we will be having a panel discussion on evolution and race. And then Wednesday, David Campbell, who is a Cornell class of 77 and a, a high school biology teacher in Florida who has been a leader in the, the, the recent uh, creationism wars in, in Florida, um, will be speaking and being on a panel. And then on Saturday, Don Prothero, who is a um, very well-known vertebrate paleontologist, but uh, is also an incredibly prolific author, is going to be talking about his latest book, which is basically a catalog of the examples uh, from the fossil record that provide evidence for evolution. And uh, it's a really terrific book if you're looking for that kind of resource. He will be here on Saturday. All day Saturday at the museum is also family day. So uh, if you're looking for something to bring the family to, there will be all kinds of really interesting things at the museum. And the birthday party, Charles Darwin's birthday party, is uh, that night, complete with cake, entertainment, and all kinds of interesting things. Tickets for that uh, you can buy at the back or at the door. Um, and uh, you can win, uh, there's a raffle that you can enter to win a free trip to the American Museum of Natural History. So um, with no further ado, the, um, the idea of this year's program in general was not to pick a particular theme for the week, but rather to kind of try to cover the waterfront uh, to appeal to as many different kinds of people as possible with something uh, for, for everybody. So uh, today we thought that we would organize a discussion that would, at least this is what I suggested to these folks that they talk about, I'm not sure what they'll talk about, but that Cornell obviously spends a great deal of money and a great deal of time on the life sciences. And uh, particularly right now, the life sciences are changing rapidly and growing in stature on this and other campuses. And so we invited uh, not necessarily people who spend all of their time thinking about evolution, but people who spend all of their time thinking about the life sciences to um, tell us what they think evolution has to do with what they do uh, right now. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, Vice Provost for Life Sciences, Steve Kresovich, who will be our moderator. Thanks, Warren. 
I'd like to say that the people that are going to speak today think about evolution every day. Uh, we have a really interesting group of speakers, and you'll see as they make their presentations how deeply they think about evolutionary biology in the broadest context. So first of all, I am Vice Provost for Life Sciences, and as, as you all are aware, Cornell has made significant investments over the last decade in the life sciences. These actions have included significant funding for people. We've hired over 80 new faculty members since 1998. Graduate students and student, uh, student involvement. For example, the Presidential Life Sciences Fellows Program is in its sixth year. We recruit about 15 fellows each year in the life sciences, and they work in various labs across six colleges here at the campus. Uh, significant investment in facilities. In October, we opened Wow Hall. That was over a $160 million project. And just general infrastructure to support life sciences. So whether it's life sciences core facilities that support DNA sequencing or genotyping or microarray work, or the great group in computational biology services unit down at Rhodes Hall. Significant investment by the central administration and deans for improving life sciences opportunities, both in research and education here. And it's both an effort to build and rebuild. So what are we attempting to rebuild? We're trying to establish and reinforce our preeminence in a number of particular areas that are unique to Cornell. Ecology and evolutionary biology, neurobiology and behavior, nutritional sciences, plant sciences, and veterinary sciences. And in complement with those classic strengths that we have, we're trying to build in areas that we feel are critically important in the 21st century for Cornell as a campus that links up with its medical school. So those key areas include the new Institute for Cell and Molecular Biology that's led by Scott Emmer, the Department of Biomedical Engineering led by Mike Schuler, and then lastly, the Department of Biological Statistics and Computational Biology, and Carlos is a member of that department. A keystone discipline within the life sciences at Cornell is evolutionary biology. And in this field, we have strengths across a number of the colleges, and I think through the discussions today, those will be highlighted. Evolutionary biology provides us with theories and approaches to answer such fundamental questions as what unites biology? What is common across life forms? What is unique? What makes a tomato a tomato, or a dog a dog, or a horse a horse? And ultimately, why questions. Why is it this way? What are the products and processes that are important to understand how diversity is organized today? Moreover, evolutionary biology helps us find, use, and ultimately value and appreciate biodiversity. These advances in turn allow us to affect health in the broadest context, and that health involves ecosystems health, human health, animal health, plant health, psychological health, and economic health. So Cornell University has benefited greatly from advances in evolutionary biology, particularly as it relates to the broadest contexts of life sciences. For example, Cornell may be unique as it grew into a major research institution without having a medical school on its campus. As such, the breadth of life sciences is great here, and we study numerous biological species ranging from E. coli, fruit fly, tomato and rice, horse and dog, and evolutionary biology provides us the theories and ultimately the language to help investigators communicate across organisms and particular biological questions. So this afternoon, we're gonna have three speakers that represent the breadth of evolutionary biology here at Cornell, and the three speakers are Carlos Bustamante, Andrew Clark, and Bill Carpe. and uh, I'll say a little bit about each of them. Uh, first of all, Andy Clark is a faculty member, a professor in the Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics, and focuses on a number of issues. I, I went to his website, and Andy is one of those people that he works with everybody, and he's very inquisitive and active. So here's what Andy's research foci are. Population genetics of insect immunity. Evolution of the Y chromosome in Drosophila. Population genetics of sperm displacement. 
human and comparative genomics, evolution of metabolic regulation, genetic basis of complex diseases, assorted topics in theoretical population genetics. He's really a renaissance guy and he's a lot of fun to work with, so you enjoy his presentation. Second, uh, Bill Crepe will speak. Bill is the chair of the plant biology department and he's been a long serving chair, I don't know how many years, 15, 18? It's incredible that he's gone through the transition to unite plant sciences at the Cornell campus. He's integrated a number of divergent interests in plant biology from systematic biology through basic biology and has worked hard in that area. He also serves as a, as a researcher in paleobotany. So he works very closely with people in systematics here at Cornell University and is active with people that are involved in computational sciences and curatorship for the Bailey Hortorium. And the last speaker will be Carlos Bustamante, a professor in biological statistics and computational biology. A lot like Andy, he's a popular person on campus. So I went to Carlos's website, and I'll talk a little bit about Carlos's work. He works in the area of theoretical uh, population genetics and really trying to draw inferences from population and comparative genomics and focusing on how natural selection and demographic history affect how genetic diversity is organized in nature. And he works both with natural species and natural populations and domesticated species. So he works with humans, macaques, canines, rodents, rice, Arabidopsis, E. coli, Salmonella, and Drosophila. So these people that will speak today have networks of people that they're involved with, and I think they'll highlight some of those activities. So just a couple ground rules. The process for t today's uh, session will be each speaker will take five to 10 minutes to, to open up the discussion. And it better be a discussion, and we're looking for dialogue here, or I'll cut it off by 5.40. We want a dialogue. The speaker will speak five to 10 minutes, and we'll open it up for a few brief questions. We'll go through all three speakers, and then we'll open up for broader discussion. So with that, I think the first speaker will be Andy Clark. Andy? Yeah. I'm starting to figure out what the assignment is here. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess one of the big surp uh, uh, surprises about uh, Darwin's uh, ability to have uh, nailed the way evolution seems to work so well is the fact that he didn't know genetics, and we're all so firmly uh, immersed in genetics that, it, that it's uh, the, the tension between how could one understand evolution so deeply without understanding the basis of transmission of traits from one generation to another is pretty striking. So a lot of the work that we do is precisely at that tension between uh, evolution at the sort of phenotypic level that, that uh, Darwin looked at and evolution at the, at the genotypic level. And of course, the, across the life sciences at Cornell, there's an awful lot of research that really addresses these, these uh, general questions, even if people don't think about it as being evolutionary biology so much. So uh, any effort, one could argue, that is um, based at uh, this issue of understanding how do particular genetic variations result in particular changes in the phenotype is uh, at some level related to this, this problem of evolutionary biology. And so um, you can imagine, for instance, um, the sorts of phenotypes that we looked at, some of the things that uh, Steve mentioned are, are having to do with uh, metabolism in flies. So there might be particular uh, selective constraints on metabolism. And, I guess another theme that one could work through this is this perception that evolution is something that those dusty old, I mean, sorry, exciting dinosaurs did, and it isn't happening today. Instead, in fact, um, there's plenty of evidence, and this part of the work that's ongoing is is actually manifesting the the uh, evidence for evolution in, in process today. And one of them actually has to do with metabolism. So uh, with the change in climate that we're introducing to the planet, there actually are a number of shifts in clines of particular uh, locations of organisms geographically in space, and also locations of particular genetic variants in space are shifting as a result of the change in, in climate. So basically, the more uh, uh, 
uh, allelic forms that are adapted to warmer temperatures are mo moving more poleward. And we've seen this in a couple of clines in Drosophila, largely metabolic differences that are, that are showing those changes. So this uh, then is one theme that we see a lot of, of trying to sort of resolve that tension between genotype and phenotype. Um, with respect to humans, a fair amount of our work has to do with human variation and the sort of patterning of human variation on the planet and, uh, and again, evidence for selection in humans, evidence for relationships between variation at the genotypic and phenotypic levels in, in humans. And that's probably where a good fraction of the research in human genetics is going on today is having to do with uh, complex traits where that relationship between genotype and phenotype can be difficult. In particular, uh, complex traits that are related to, uh, I guess we could call them disorders, but they're sort of phenotypes that increase your risk of, of uh, morbidity. Things like obesity, like risk of diseases like cancers, where we know there's not a single gene that's behind them, but there are many, many genes that are involved, and there's complex interactions between gene and phenotype. So the particular phenotype that we spend a lot of time on is cardiovascular disease. We don't have a medical clinic or anything like that. We work at the level of trying to understand this based on data that we receive from collaborators who are uh, determining genotypes at many, many positions of humans across the genome, and also many medically related phenotypes, cholesterol levels, and so forth. And the challenge is, to, is basically a modeling one. Where in this sea of variants across the whole genome are there variants that are actually responsible for those differences in disease risk? And um, that's, a, that's a problem that really uh, is very close to the sort of general evolutionary problem of relating the process of mutation, the, the path of those mutants through a population, uh, what sort of mutations increase in frequency, are the variants that are responsible for things like cardiovascular disease uh, more likely to be alleles that are very rare in the population? Do some of them get, get to be common? And why are the ones that are common as common as they are? Were they favorable in the past? So are we seeing echoes of our past evolutionary history that are coming back to bite us in the form of these sorts of complex disorders? So it's a fascinating area, one where um, the collection of the data has become incredibly simple to the point where, uh, simple in the sense that it's, it's very easy to collect large volumes of data, and it's, it's to the point where that's probably also going to m modify things in very interesting ways with respect to humans. So ability to know oneself genetically is, is ramping up at, in a dramatic way now. The so-called personalized medicine has given rise to uh, the ability to uh, identify one's genotype at as many as a million positions across the genome. Many of those positions are relevant to many of these phenotypes. A lot of that information we don't know very well yet, but that's just a matter of time before we know more and more about what those genetic variants mean. And so some of them will be related to severe diseases, and there will be an opportunity for individuals at a much broader scale to, to uh, make decisions about reproduction and so forth based on a very much richer picture of one's genotype. How much difference that'll make to human evolution? Who knows, but it's, it's just an interesting thing to think about how we're able to sort of short circuit that connection between genotype and phenotype. And I'm about out right there. So I guess the thing I would emphasize is that um, uh, the sort of uh, thinking about variation in populations in an evolutionary context is, is vital to just about everything we do. It, it, it illuminates all aspects of genetic research and, and is tremendously uh, enjoyable at this point. Do so. you want to take a, a, any question to start before we go to Bill? Okay, so let's get the Bill. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> I have a, a, a broader view of the relationship between the life sciences effort here and, uh, and evolution. And it's at a greater scale. It's not as fine a scale as what Andy just talked about. But I must say within the Department of Plant Biology, there are a number of approaches. I went today, I thought I'd highlight the big scale issues. So in a sense, biodiversity is, is the result of evolution in every sense. 
and understanding biodiversity, which is urgent these days because of climatic change and its implications, puts a lot of pressure on understanding evolutionary relationships. And uh, I'd, li I'd like to talk for a moment about how we went on, how we approach understanding the diversity of life. Now, I'd also like to highlight the fact that genomics has been a very important part, a very important tool in our understanding of diversity and that there's a historically interesting set of uh, events that give us a better idea of the relationships among organisms or phylogenetic relationships, which is very useful knowledge, actually, and I'll show you why in a minute. There's a set of events that happen that allows us to have this understanding, and I thought it would be worth commenting on it in the context of the Life Sciences Initiative. And of course, exploiting biodiversity, preserving biodiversity, and manipulating biodiversity are correlates of understanding biodiversity and, and all those things in the most positive way in the, in the climate we exist in today are desirable. Well, first of all, there, the coincidence of developments I, I allude to in terms of understanding biodiversity uh, start with the development of what's called phylogenetics. How do, how do we look at an array of organisms and decide how they might be related to each other? We look for common features. We imagine how those features change from one group to another. We look for evidence that they're related based on some of those common features. And for, well, I would say a couple hundred years at least, a lot of this has been intuitive. Some very intelligent people gave it a lot of thought, probably no more intelligent than Charles Darwin. But as Andy noted, he wasn't informed by genetics in those days. But it's only relatively recently that people really started to get objective about calculating relationships. And there are various ways to do it. The one I'm most familiar is, with is called parsimony analysis, but there are a great number of ways to do it. And it's a rapidly changing field. So how did we started this parsimony analysis and there were statistical models as well but basically trying to calculate precisely relationships among organisms began i would say in the late 60s don't check me on that i might be off by a few years and this was based on morphology anatomy and sometimes natural products chemistry those were the characters used to calculate the sets of relationships and that had some advantages it was less subjective than previous taxonomies or evolutionary uh, or assessments of evolutionary relationships. But on the other hand, it was impeded by the fact that it required some degrees of subjectivity, such as what characters do you choose to include in your analysis and what hypotheses do you use, do you want to lay over your choice of characters? For example, is organ A really the equivalent of organ B that has changed to organ A through evolutionary change? It may be so, but it may be difficult to prove, and it is a subjective assessment. And as, again, the, the selection of characters is also very important. So while we made great strides with morphology, anatomy, and natural products chemistry-based assessments or relationships, a great and wonderful a change occurred when we started using gene sequence data to calculate relationships. And there's been a tremendous evolution in methodologies there, but, and there are still some issues we can point to that might be problematical in the future, or, or not problematical in the future, but might detract from the perfection of such hypotheses of phylogenetic relationships. But they're being addressed, I think, and ultimately we'll have it all settled. Now, for a paleontologist to extol the virtues of molecular systematics is what it amounts to. That is, systematics that's based on calculations of relationships based on gene sequences. For a paleontologist to suggest that this is an ideal way may be sort of heretical. But I tell you, it's got tremendous advantages because there are so many intractable problems in evolution. In fact, one of the biggest ones is the origin of the major group of plants that we eat, live in, basically, and, and before synthetics, we wore clothes that at least the plant-derived ones were, were derived from, from natural fibers. Here's Charles Darwin on the cover of this month's American Journal of Botany, and the reason is 
This most important group of plants is still poorly understood with regard to evolutionary context. And the major organs that define this group, the flowers, you're all familiar with that, this is the flowering plants, the homologies or the equivalent organs in non-flowering plants really uh, are the subjects of a great deal of controversy. So these things have been extremely frustrating. And to have, what, so what is the reason that having gene sequences come along as a basis for phylogenetic analysis, so, so hopeful a development? Well, because with, with, even though there are issues in terms of alignment and so forth, it's really an objective way to calculate relationships and therefore it is unencumbered by people's particular views on how things ought to be because we're in a generational transition now where you know the tradition in certain areas of science where strict adherence to certain points of view and die hard defense of your point of view and it's been very difficult for in that generational transition for some people to let go of what they want and with regard to calculating relationships based only on morphology and structure, it's possible to shade the, the data that are used for analysis to give you a certain outcome, but not with, not with gene sequence analyses. Now, what's the downside of gene sequence analyses? Well, fossils don't have gene sequences, and all fossils that have been reported as having some preserved DNA have, have not panned out well. But there are ways around this. Calculations can include gene sequences and morphology and anatomy. There are some technical difficulties there. But it's coming around, and my point is that there's a strong relationship between genomics, particularly what I would, a, a sort of comparative genomics, and, uh, and understanding evolution through these developments in phylogenetics. Now, once you have this, uh, once you understand relationships, it's a powerful tool and a tool of very great practical value. For example, if you know that a certain biomedicinal compound exists in a particular taxon, and you'd like to find other species that, have, that may have some related compound, you could uh, go through the jungle, as people have, and randomly look for this compound in everything that grows there. Or you could look at this hypothesis of relationships. You could look for the closest relatives of the taxon or species that you know has this compound and see if it's there. It'll cut down your search time tremendously. Another example would be as the climate changes and we, we see areas of increasing drought, we might want to look for genes that uh, confer some drought resistance to crop plants, as we are doing. And uh, what should we do, look at random or look for close relatives? And of course, the quality of our understanding of relationships is extremely important in a search of this kind. So understanding biodiversity in a very precise way is of extreme value to us, and we're doing, and great progress is being made in that area. Another valuable thing about it is we can assess uh, to some extent the effects of extinction in particular ecological areas, which is also going to be important, but requires a few more steps I don't want to talk about today. Now, in terms of intractable evolutionary problems, once you have a set of relationships, you can sometimes solve such problems, but in the case of the great flowering plant mystery, we still have no hope. But there is hope in another aspect of genomics that's related to systematics and evolution, and that is by looking at the genes that produce certain organs. And for example, the flower, a great deal of progress has been made in understanding the genes that produce flowers. Ultimately, by looking for similar genes in non-flowering plants, and we're not there yet, we may be able to make better guesses at, at some point, and then ultimately we'll know what groups are most closely related, how the genes evolved to produce flowers from non-flowering plants, and we can solve mysteries in that way, and things are going on 
in that fashion. And in understanding the, uh, the importance of specific genes, of course, it opens up the opportunity for us to manipulate agricultural crops in ways that may be beneficial, especially, especially in this uh, era of climatic change. We could manipulate genes to produce more biomass that would give us more in the way of biofuels. If we discover particularly beneficial biomedicinal chemicals, we could alter the metabolism of plants in such a way that they produce more of those chemicals. These things all depend on this kind of an approach. And just from the basic science point of view, there might be some real fun in the future. I think of things like once we understand in a better way the, the distribution of critical genes and their function, we could experiment by trying to recreate extinct mosaics or transitional forms or missing links. We could turn on some genes, turn off some genes, see what we get, try to recreate things. So in the basic science arena, that may be a ways off. It's complicated. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of things we will be able to do through genetic manipulation. Now, this raises the specter, of course, of uh, genetically manipulated organisms, which is a whole set of other issues that I don't intend to talk about. Let's just su suggest that they will be carefully managed and that there won't be too much controversy in the future. So basically, there's a key, there's a critical relationship between genomics and understanding biodiversity Biodiversity is the result of evolution. And I haven't mentioned fossils, which is my own research expertise, but um, such phylogenetic understanding gives us, can be used to precisely identify fossils and to return to a theme. There's been an awful lot of subjectivity in describing and identifying fossil taxa if one boils it down to listing the characteristics present in a fossil and putting them into an analysis and getting that you have a specific result that, that's both uh, observable and objective as possible. And so there's yet another dimension to the basic uh, value of phylogenetics and its, its implications. Questions? Yeah. Is there any hope of um, uh, trying to, uh, you mentioned that uh, there's a transition from a phonetic or uh, classification scheme to a genetic one, and at the end you mentioned these mosaics. Um, what I'm wondering is if there's some way uh, to make progress, rather, to look at the difference between gene trees and species trees to remove some of that subjectivity, which was inherent in some of the older classification schemes rather than looking at it as a pure transition to a genetic realm. Oh yeah, we combine the data. So you can have morphology, anatomy, and chemistry characters combined with gene sequence characters in the same analysis. Are there specific tests, statistical tests being developed to discriminate the difference between gene trees and species trees that are generated by you know, two different groups of people or or two different methods? Well, there are different ways to analyze each analysis. I don't know if I would look at the, the methods to discriminate between two specific well, analyses. Yeah, somebody creates a classification of plants uh, based on phenetic or phenotypic characters. Or and you, have, and you have a bunch of genes, you find that the gene tree might not match the species tree that you've created. OK, so there's a reason for that. So you look at each analysis separately. And uh, that's the way I would go about it. And but it doesn't have to be a finite. as a thing that we're moving just to looking at only genes. You could look at the future that you could maybe enhance systematics and, 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 uh, and morphological based ones based on trying to understand from gene trees what might be going wrong in classifications based on morphology. Yeah, that's a generally, I mean, you say what's wrong with more. That kind of difference is being examined carefully, you know, even as we speak. And I, I like the method of combining. It's a, there's some level of matter of taste, but I like combining data sets so the gene trees aren't separate from the morphology trees. And actually, well, it depends. Again, there is, there is subjectivity in those morphology-based trees. 
And uh, there are issues with gene trees that can be argued, but I don't think they'll hold up as weaknesses in the future as more genes are sequenced and more genes are used in phylogenetic analyses and so forth and so on. But I don't, I don't see that that inherent conflict is going to last as we get more information. Let's hold off now, my partners. Thanks, Bill. So I want to thank uh, Steve for uh, the invitation um, uh, to be here. Um, in thinking a little bit about this 150th uh, celebration of the publication of Origin and, um, and of, uh, of Darwin's birthday, I'm, I'm sort of reminded of, a, of um, a book review that my friend Andrew Barry wrote on the uh, biography of, of Darwin that was published a few years ago. And as many of you know, Darwin's biography is sort of a cottage industry, right? There are several that are published every year. And one of the things that Andrew noted is that evolutionary biology is one of those fields that labors under the problem that our founder basically got it right the first time around, and that many of us have been trying to fill in the details sort of ever since. And in speaking after my distinguished colleagues, I'm left with even less things to, to, to talk about. And so I'll, I'll try to be brief and, and, and hit a little bit upon how some of the things that Darwin first um, highlighted, and, and anyone who's ever read The, the Origin or, or read really any of, of Darwin's writing is just always struck by how much he sort of laid out there and, and, and how really deep the, the insights were given the, the data that he, that he had at, at hand. And so I think I wanted to focus on, on sort of three themes that reverberate through the, 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 the talks we've heard today. The first is the question of human origins and our relationship to other primates and how um, that today is probably more important than, than ever before, particularly in, in this sort of age of genomics. Um, the second is I, I want to talk a little bit about domesticated um, plant and animals, which as, as many of you know was one of Darwin's um, main uh, sort of evidence that he marshaled for the, the, the cause of evolution, but also uh, he, he wrote a book on um, several books on domesticated plant and animals, and, and today this is probably an area of incredibly active research and one where Cornell is probably a world leader second to, to none. Um, and, and the third is, is um, what um, uh, Bill talked about, the, the notion of uh, the diversification of life and conservation and how um, genetics is really sort of reshaping our, our views and, and thoughts on, on that and, and really in, in, in an evolutionary light. Um, so turning to, to the first, um, it has really been astounding um, to be in this field um, in, in the past decade and, and see the, the revolutions that have happened in terms of our understanding of, of human origins and how um, each subsequent primate sequence that is um, put together really helps us hone in and understand what it means to be human at a molecular level. Um, and, and by that I mean, um, many ways to, to echo what Andy talked about, namely, we now have the tools to go through and compare primate genome against primate genome against primate genome, as well as to other mammalian genomes and hone in on those pieces of DNA that make us unique as a species. And, and that's incredibly powerful, incredibly deep, and something that our generation of scientists is really sort of seeing for the first time. And, and it's incredibly exciting to think about how in, in short time, we'll really sort of piece together both a catalog of those genetic variants and hopefully begin to piece together what that means at a cellular level and, or, at, and how that sort of reverberates on up to, to really think about what it means to be human and, and what it means to be unique. And, and really that is, in, in many ways, uh, arises from the intersection and understanding of evolutionary biology and genetics. Um, the second is that as, as the acquisition of genetic data has become cheaper and cheaper, we are now cataloging more and more human genetic variation, both in an effort to correlate it with phenotypes and other disease of interest, but also to understand our ancient migrations and how we've um, moved throughout the, 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 the planet and, and sort of a history that's been obscured. Um, but now that we as we began to get more and more human genomes, um, we're able to, to, to tease apart and really sort of, again, understand for the very first time at a, at a very detailed and fine scale level. Um, Andy and I both got the tremendous privilege to be involved with a project known as the Thousand Genomes Project, which is an international effort 
to document genetic variation uh, um, across 1,000 human genomes. And in short order, there will be a 10,000 human genome project and then a 100,000 genome project. And within a dozen years, we'll have millions of human genomes that will really, for the, the first time, give us a, a, a detailed view of how different populations differ from each other and sort of raises all sorts of um, fundamental and important ethical questions about um, our common human origins, but also our understanding of, um, of relationships among groups and, and issues of, of race and ethnicity, as um, I know Steve is sort of interested in, in thinking about. And again, um, these are questions that are informed fundamentally by our understanding and continued research into uh, evolutionary biology and, and patterns of process at the, at the population level. Um, the, the second thing I want to talk a little bit about are domesticated plant and animals. As I said, many of us know that Darwin um, spent a lot of time thinking and writing about domesticated plant and animals, and this is an incredibly exciting time to be working in, in this area because many of the genetic um, resources that end up getting developed for human community and the human genetics community end up percolating into others. And one in which um, there's been tremendous progress has been in the application of genetic technologies, both to improvement of, um, of plant and animal, and animal uh, domesticated plant and animals, but also in our understanding of how domestication comes about. And so if I think about my colleagues working on, um, on rice, it's been incredibly exciting to see the cloning and characterization of genes that tell us about shattering and many of the of the genetic changes that we humans have um, induced in uh, the plants that we've domesticated. And up the street, I've got um, colleagues that we work on in understanding the, the dog genome and mapping the genetic differences among um, dog breeds and using dogs as a model system for understanding mammalian phenotypic diversity. And again, this is um, a time when these are the, the first times that we've been able to get a, a very detailed view of the genetics and genomics of dogs, and by applying an evolutionary approach, we can begin to look for regions that strong, show strong signatures of selection and may have been and captured genes that um, are important in, in the domestication process. And, and ultimately, by comparing to the wolf genome, which will be soon down the line, we'll begin to understand where are those aggression genes, where are those temperamental changes that um, have allowed us to take these uh, wolves of our childhood nightmare and turn them into our bedside companions. And so, um, again, it's incredibly exciting to think about how that will be um, in short order. We actually just had a, a fun little paper where um, we um, looked at coat color in, in wolves and, and found the kind of serendipitous result that the black coat color of, of, of wolves actually probably came from dogs. And it's sort of fun to think about how um, we've sort of taken and, and inverted what has been the, the paradigm of reduced genetic variation in domesticated plant and animals and used it to find a, a kind of cool and, and exciting story. And um, again, this is sort of really the, um, reflects the, the kind of exciting times that we live in where um, evolutionary biology, even though Darwin basically got it right, we've been now lucky enough to begin to fill in the details. And, and I think Bill did a, a tremendously elegant job of, of describing the importance of genetics and genomics to, to conservation. I had the, the privilege of being in Panama a couple weeks ago with um, a course that Steve O'Brien, a, a famous alum of Cornell, organized. And um, one of the things that Steve really emphasized is just how exciting this generation of conservation biologists um, have to look forward to where, again, these genetic um, resources allow us to go in and, and go into a system where um, it's not a model system. It could be a species that no one's ever worked on um, genetically before. But again, because we've had these advances, we can come in, build a genome, and begin to, to think about how um, that can inform conservation decisions. So, um, and again, at, at that basic level, it's a, it's a question of beginning to think about population processes, applying those to interesting um, genetic questions, and, and then ultimately answering fundamental biological questions. So even though uh, the origin's 150 years old, it's probably uh, more relevant and pertinent today than, than it probably has ever been before. And these are just incredibly exciting times to, to be in these area. So thank you. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. OK, so what we'd like to do now is open it up for a discussion. And for the audience, please, when you get up, identify yourself. And if you have some sort of affiliation, do that. And then raise your point, and let's start the discussion. So can we open it up for discussion with the group now? Any points or questions? Warren. 
as incredible as it, or as horrible as it is for the four of you to contemplate, you all know that um, you're preaching to the choir largely in this, in this uh, room, and that 50% or so of Americans don't believe anything that any of you just said. And furthermore, when you drill down and, and look at the demographics of that, 50% of physicians say that they have trouble with evolution. 50% of various other specialties in, in, biology, in applied biology. Um, and in my business, you very frequently hear people say, well, we don't need any of the stuff that you guys just said. Um, because as long as you know how the car runs, you can fix the car. You don't need to know where the car came from. <clears throat> Each one of you tr have tried to address that, because that's what we were hoping you would do. But do you want to say any more, any of you want to say any more about specifically confronting the, the challenge that says we don't actually really need evolution to do any of the incredible applied things that we're all talking about. We just need a lot of PCR machines. The understanding of evolutionary relationships has immediate value in a number of dimensions, which I think all of us touched upon. Whether you can convert someone who doesn't believe in evolution to believing in evolution is another question. And I think of, and you mentioned physicians, so these are reasonably intelligent people, presumably. And uh, they choose to suspend their logical acumen for the purpose of denying evolution. That's how I look at it. I don't think you can discuss evolution or disbelief in evolution in the logical framework because I believe it's fundamentally illogical and I believe that there are, it's a belief system. Non-evolution is a belief system and it's a person's personal choice and I really don't like to engage in, in a reasoning contest with someone who has no rules of logic encumbering their arguments. I'm reminded of, of the story that Steve Gould used to tell um, about the first zoonotic transplant where um, this little girl got a baboon heart, as I recall, and they, uh, the, she lived for some time and then ultimately died, and, and they interviewed the surgeon and, you know, they asked him, you know, why did you use a baboon heart and not a chimpanzee heart if chimpanzees are more closely related to, to humans? And apparently, okay, this was Gould's story, not mine, but apparently he, the doctor responded, well, I, what do you mean I don't believe in evolution? Um, and, you know, there are all kinds of reasons that he could have given, oh, the baboon is smaller, it was a little girl, it made more sense, or, you know, oh, chimps are closer to humans, and so, you know, maybe they had zoonotic infections or something that we wanted to prevent against. But I mean, that's an example where you could say, well, you know, maybe if it used a chimp heart, it could have worked better and the girl could have lived longer or something. So I mean, I think there are certainly cases where doctors not believing in evolution could have deep repercussions. At the same time, I think most doctors appreciate, you know, the antibiotic resistance and, and how it evolves. And so I think it's a question of leading them along and, and leading the public along. And, and most would like to draw a line between something like antibiotic resistance and the evolution of humans from, from monkeys. And so it's sort of a question of where do you draw the line. I mean, there, there, are, there have been eminent evolutionary biologists who called for a sort of truce, uh, particularly with respect to conservation, and say, well, you know, tomato, tomato, let's split the difference, and stewardship is more important than understanding mechanism. And that's sort of another line that folks have put forth and very famous folks have put forth. So I think it's a, it's a tough question and it all depends on what the ultimate purpose of the discussion we, you know you want to have. Go ahead. Jim Reveal, Plant Sciences. Gentlemen, Darwin published 150 years ago in the decade of the 1940s there was a great synthesis starting with Huxley and ending with Stebbins in 1950. What's the next synthesis and when is it going to occur?
I'm going to turn to the man at the end of the table. So <laughs> we'll be responsible for the synthesis, so he can tell us when he's ready. Well, I was all eager to answer the preceding question. <laughs> yeah, so let me do address that first, because that actually is, is uh, something that I, I really do rise to the challenge of. So is evolution sort of relevant today to the life sciences? And, and in human genetics, it's actually astonishing, even to me, the, the role that population genetics plays in, in uh, the sort of uh, determination of genes that are responsible for genetic diseases in humans. Now this is sort of defining evolution a little bit more specifically in, in modern terms where these sort of microevolutionary processes, the role of mutation and drift and natural selection in uh, resulting in variation within a population. That, that's the area that several of us study, and it, it's sort of microevolutionary in the sense that we're not so much explaining differences between species, although it's relevant to that as well, but more addressing the question of variation within a species. And, of course, Darwin was very familiar with that phenomenon and was very interested in it. But now we're in a position where, so we have all these tools for assessing variation, for quantifying mutation very precisely. Um, and that's sort of been marching along and separate, altogether separate from that was the field of human genetics, which thought that the way you find ge genes that are responsible for diseases is you identify a bunch of individuals with a disease, put them on pedigrees and try to understand is there co-transmission those, in those families of the diseases with particular genetic markers that they would follow. And then it was only within the last six or so years it was realized that, now wait a minute, we're actually all in one big family. In a sense, we're all related to each other. So rather than following it just in individual pedigrees, why not sort of trace back variants that we all have that are segregating in the population and trace them on a sort of a, a family tree of all of humans, looking for degrees of relationship between individuals that have diseases and trying to find genetic markers that are more similar between individuals um, that have disease versus those that do not. And they call this association testing. And so it's the idea of just score enough markers and score enough individuals with disease and maybe by chance you'll find some, some uh, sort of correlated markers that are correlated with disease. And all of that, the whole underlying principle of it, the way it works, the way the designs work, the improvement of the methods for finding genes, um, relies on population genetics, this phenomenon of correlations between genes we call linkage disequilibrium in population genetics. That was an incredibly esoteric kind of backwater thing that a bunch of theoreticians did for several decades. And, and now it's like the central pillar for how we find genes in humans. And, and it's, um, it's been remarkably effective. In just the last couple of years, more than 240 papers have been published doing this method of random association of markers and, and more than 80 genes that are uh, underlying some of these traits. So macular degeneration, for instance, the whole research paradigm for uh, the causal mechanisms for macular degeneration have been turned around as a result of these sorts of methods. So, so does evolutionary thinking impact medical genetics? Absolutely. It's at the, it's at the foundation of it now. Um, new synthesis? <laughs> you think you just gave it, Andy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, maybe uh, it is in the sense th that uh, um, it, it sort of goes both ways. I mean, I alluded to the fact that there's, there's this sort of process of short-circuiting evolution by us understanding it so well and manipulating it through the, in the forms of domestication and the forms of transgenics. Um, new synthesis with respect to the way natural populations work. I guess a lot of the, the sort of uh, first synthesis, which was a sort of fusion of population genetics with, with uh, Darwinian theory, a lot of the changes that we've seen in, in genetic thinking lately have, have related to the non-equilibrium status of, of genetics in populations, whereas the, the sort of older way to think of it was everything's at equilibrium and we're sort of new mutations come through, but there's a fairly close to equilibrium status. And I mean, the, the human population could not be further from equilibrium. It's really, really a, it's almost frightening thing to think about that the effective population size of humans is about 10,000. That means if we were a small island of 10,000 people and uh, were allowed to stay on that island and go to equilibrium between mutation and, and mutation and drift and selection, 
there would be about as much variation on that island of 10,000 people as there is in humans today. So the effective equivalent balance between mutation and drift would be how much variation we would have in the population today. And yet we're approaching 10 billion people. That's a million individuals for each effective individual in that population of, of 10,000. And so what that means is right now, we have as much variation as the population in 10,000, but we're in fact 10 billion. We're in this process of accumulating mutation at, as fast as we can until we get to the point of attaining that new balance of the amount of variation that would be in a population at balance with, at balance with 10 billion. So there is this um, profound uh, departure from equilibrium that's resulting in a very different change in the, the structure of the sort of genetic variation among individuals. We're way too related to each other. There's way too much uh, sort of very recent mutation in our population compared to your typical equilibrium population. So a new synthesis might be a much better accommodation of this sort of uh, departure from equilibrium that's probably not unique to humans. That, in fact, even Drosophila, we know, are out of equilibrium in a similar way. Well, I, I think one thing to add there is that the, the other sort of big development that we've seen probably has to do with the merging of a, a much better understanding of gene regulation and cellular processes into evolutionary thinking. And so if we think about evolutionary models, they were all basically mathematical equations, right? Consider a diallelic locus, big A, little a, and they're all just sort of symbols that you write down and, and, and come up with mathematical sort of descriptions of how populations are going to evolve. And I think one very nice development in, in thinking about molecular biology and evolution has been how we begin, we've begun to fill in a lot of the intermediate steps. And so you look for something that looks like it has an evolutionarily interesting signal. You try to understand how that then percolates up into gene expression and uh, um, location and development. I mean, the whole merging of evolution and development, I mean, the fact that they were for a long time totally separate, and now with regulation and cell biology, I mean, cell biologists, I would say, for the most part, still don't really incorporate a lot of evolutionary thinking into to what they do, and thinking about how that is all going to really come into a new biology is really exciting. And I would say that's where you're going to really begin to see a, a big synthesis in terms of going all the way from the molecular signals of selection towards the understanding of phenotype, and it's also going to relate intimately to medical genetics, where they want to take signals of association and then link them into how that affects pathways and how those pathways are altered in, in different ideologies. To add on that, based on the synthesis, maybe it's not synthesis, but more of an integration. This is already occurring, right? So for those of us that did manual sequencing 20 years ago and at the end of the week, if we would have 500 or 1,000 base pairs analyzed with a postdoc and a technician, uh, like we'd head off to the bar on Friday night and celebrate. So the integration of engineering and physical sciences into technologies that greatly expand the biological questions that we now can ask in a meaningful way is really important. Then on top of the physical sciences and engineers, the computational engagement with uh, people that do theory or problem solving and computational sciences that goes on now. Now we've gone from can we generate this information or can we go this far in the genome to we've got this ton of information, how do we make sense of it? And those things are occurring. And I think as much as people like to throw things at people like Craig Venner, there are people that see integration going on all the time, and it's broad beyond biology, and it's something that we pride ourselves on here at Cornell and look forward to uh, stronger connections between computer and information sciences here and the physical scientists and engineers with biology people as well. Uh, another question? Since I talk long, I want to go. Can I do one? I'm going to. I'm the chair, so let me. So I wanted to ask the, the group, uh, how do we define race? And what role does race play, if any, in personalized medicine in the future? And are we allowed to use the word race? And is it offensive or problematic? Or does it lead to concerns about eugenics in the 21st century? Well, I think there's another 
forum tomorrow night on that very topic. I work on plants, guys. <laughs> I, think, I mean, race is such a loaded word, right? That they do. It, it, it should certainly be struck from our biological vocabulary because whenever you invoke it, it immediately has a gazillion different connotations. And so I think, in, in terms of thinking about, I mean, race is obviously an incredibly important sociological concept, it's an incredibly important psychological concept, but in, in terms of being a biological concept, I think it's too loaded a word to, to use. That being said, it has now been replaced by continent of geographic origin, you know, as a sort of cumbersome and, and odd proxy for what folks want to talk about, which is, are there really different sort of human populations, and, and how do they relate to one another, and, 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 and I think in a trivial answer, there are a gazillion different populations, and when you look at within every, any population, it's substructured, and we know that humans aren't a, a randomly mating population, but if anything, the recent developments have just um, reinforced what um, we learned about patterns of human genetic variation in the 70s, that the vast majority of variation is within groups, not between groups, and that it is um, largely spatial and clinal in nature, and so um, results that seem to reify our ancient notions um, of continental origins or whatever um, often have more to do with how samples were sampled and not necessarily with the real underlying patterns of, of genetic variation. There is an important application of continental origin, if you will, in medical genetics for the reason that because different human populations aren't randomly mating, if you then um, uh, fail to take that information into account in the, in the setting of mapping genes underlying complex traits and the incidence of disease differs between different populations, then you're going to find spurious associations that have everything to do with small genetic differences between the groups and nothing to do with the underlying true genetic basis of, of, of the disease. And this is something that we are confronting more and more as the technology gets deeper and deeper at looking at variation. And we begin to see that even continents like Europe, we just had a paper on Europe, is, are incredibly substructured. And so to think about Europe as a homogenous um, genetic uh, population is not an accurate representation of, of the population for some of the things that you want to do. And so, if anything, I think that it'll begin to break this down as we begin to come up with approaches that allow us to identify ever smaller and smaller subgroups, including individuals that belong to the same family. Uh, and so, I, mean, I think if, if anything, it breaks down the notions of the three or five major groups of human genetic variation into it's complex and human populations are largely spatial and we are now um, wonderfully intermingled and that sort of admixture as it's called in the literature needs to be taken into account in the design of medical genetic studies. Andy? Well, it's hard to, it's hard to add much to that. You really hit, hit pretty much all the points. The one definition you might think is, okay, so let's just forget about all the history and say, just given a blood sample, uh, could you do genetic tests that would identify it into these five major groups? Is, is that something that we have the technology to do today? And, um, you know, to a first approximation, one could do that reasonably accurately. There are issues with is the individual admix or not. But if it's an individual who the last five generations, all their ancestors were from one continent or another, African or, or Asian, uh, the technologies we have could, could quite accurately determine, yes, that's where that person is from. Um, but the thing you might not have known is, and this is sort of um, extending on something that Carlos said, is, is if one had samples from Italians and one from Swiss just across the Alps, those very same methods could distinguish them. No, that's more likely a, a Swiss than, a, than an Italian. So those methods are able to find minute differences in allele frequencies of the many, many markers that we're looking at that really don't perhaps have any useful biological meaning, but 
there's just been enough separation and time and enough just sort of random drifting of uh, minor allele frequency changes, differences between them, that you can actually start to, to uh, detect those differences in a sort of geographically meaningful way. So, okay, it's geographically meaningful, but is it meaningful in any other way with respect to differences in diseases or whatever? I mean, it's, it, it's on a different plane altogether. It's, it's sort of orthogonal to the biological meaning of, of what we really want to get at. And so um, it's really not a useful biological term. It's something that we're sort of uh, uh, living with. Uh, medical doctors do use the sort of street definition of race sometimes in diagnosis. There are some differences that statistically tend to correlate with, for instance, drug responses and so forth. And the point is that, yeah, but that's incredibly crude to relate it to race. Why not know the individual genotype of that person and ask, given that information, use that to, to make a medical diagnosis? So the real dream of the so-called personalized genomics is that it really won't matter what group you're in anymore. It's you as an individual that does or does not have the attrib genetic attributes that are going to respond in a particular way. And that's sort of the hopeful future. I, I think one interesting, um, sorry, did, did I cut you? That's it. So one interesting um, application where this is particularly contentious is in the study of trying to understand recent human adaptive evolution and trying to find um, genetic changes that um, show signatures of strong selection. And there are some that have been identified and there are some that are specific to group one group or, or another. And one classic example now is, is lactose persistence, so the ability to digest Lactose persistence, the ability to digest lactose after, um, after weaning, right? Mammals are, uh, humans are the only mammals that can really, you know, continue to produce the ability to, the, the enzyme that allows you to break down lactose, um, it's a sort of derived mutation. And when you look at individuals of Northern European ancestry, they have a much higher frequency of that constitutively expressed enzyme than other human populations. And that's presumably a result of adaptation to being able to digest milk in as a sort of a result of, of a cultural uh, decision to start drinking more milk because there, you, know, you had um, agriculture and livestock and so on. What makes the story particularly cool and interesting is that there are other human populations that have also become um, uh, pastoralists. And one uh, very nice example is the, the work of Sarah Tishkoff in looking at African pastoralist populations. Um, where she's found that there's a second mutation in the same gene, but it's a different mutation that also allows those African pastoralist populations to digest milk. And so if you were to have some very naive street definition of, of race, you'd never really get to the kind of um, cool and richness of that, of that story. Rather, it's really understanding the biology of different human groups and, and, um, and, and why certain phenotypes are expressed in certain, certain environments or certain groups and not in others, it allows you to sort of piece together that sort of rich, rich history. And so I think it's, you know, it's something that will confront more and more, but um, I think you always have to um, check your, um, your cultural baggage at the door when beginning to think about and, and talk about race because it's something that's incredibly contentious and, and sensitive, and I think we should continue to be attuned to it. There was a question in the back that I interrupted. Do you guys get a sense that maybe society is moving towards being more accepting of uh, organisms that have desirable characteristics, or do you expect to continue receiving uh, criticisms as these organisms are developed? Do you want to go first? Sure. Um, GMOs have have implications. Each one needs to be carefully evaluated, not only for the particular characteristics they wish to add to the taxon, to the species or the cultivar, but also for the environmental effects and implications. I think that society is, seems to be relatively reasonable in the long term. I think as people become more educated and as necessities dictate, uh, and as, as uh, scrutiny of individual GMOs increases in the proper number of dimensions, 
and people are more comfortable that a particular GMO will not have harmful effects on either their health or on the health of the environment, that they will ultimately be accepted and possibly they will have to be accepted in, because of critical situations involving, as I alluded to earlier, some climatic or other changes. Changes in, in the amount of poisons we want to put on our crops to protect them against insects and things of that nature. But yeah, it's, it's a complicated situation, but I think probably we will drive toward general, general acceptance of some GMOs in the relatively recent future. I think uh, it's a combination of belief system and economically driven. So in Europe, if they have money and they have food, they don't have to eat genetically modified food. That's their choice. And we have the same choice here in Ithaca, New York, for the most part. People that uh, work at this university, they have the right and opportunity to eat whatever they want. In other places, it's not so simple. And it's driven by opportunity, economics, and access to technology. So. Uh, I think it's impossible to generalize. We see more and more GMOs utilized. Now, whether that drives agriculture in the way agriculture should be driven in the 21st century is still a question that a lot of us are working on. So we'll see increases in genetically modified organisms. And it's not so much climate change, where I see the biggest effect is reduced pesticide in third world countries. So people really handle pesticides poorly in places outside the United States. It's probably true in the United States as well, but reduced pesticide in the environment's a really important thing. I think sure. An important point to, to make, though, is that all of you eat, who eat wheat are eating a modified genetic plant, a plant that results from hybridization between two unrelated grasses that human beings selected because of the advantage of the grain it produced. This is, the only difference is that the genetic difference between a bacterium that's introduced to do one thing and a two related grasses is less troublesome to most folks. But the non nonetheless, you take, go back and take a look at the genes involved and some of those genes that are involved in the creation of wheat from the two uh, ancestral grasses are genetically based on bacterial genes, simply because that's the kind of history of the genetic material that's in plants. So, you know, it's extremes that I think people are getting over exercised about in the modern era, forgetting how much advantage we've taken of, of really gross genetic changes in our uh, food and animal crops. Okay, other points or questions? Comments? Okay, I think the witching hour is here. I'd like to thank the panel, Andy Clark, Bill Crepe, Carlos Bustamante. I'd like to thank you all for coming and raising questions, and enjoy the rest of the week. <laughs>